Hello everyone and good morning and thank you for joining our Symantec Web Security webinar today. Um, so we're pleased to be joined by Mark Homden from Symantec who is going to be presenting the webinar today. Um, just before I pass over to Mark, um, I'm just going to really quickly go through some housekeeping details with you. So you are muted throughout today's webinar, but we'll hold a Q&A session at the end. So if you do have any questions, um, you can just write those in the questions box, which is just the right hand side of your screen, and we will answer those at the end. Um, I'm also recording the webinar today, so I'll send you all a link to recording um, this afternoon or tomorrow morning, most probably. And there are a couple of questions at the end, so if you would like any further information, just pop that in there and we will get back to you. Okay, so I'm now going to pass you over to Mark to run through the webinar with you all. Hi, good morning. Thank you, uh, Amy. So just a, a quick check just to ensure that uh, you can see that uh, first uh, slide up from the deck. Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Amy. And um, as uh, just introduced, my name is Mark Homden. I'm one of the solution uh, engineers at uh, Symantec, um, and I'll just be going through the uh, Symantec Web Security Service uh, with you all this morning. So um, I, I think what I want to do is just kind of probably briefly touch on sort of uh, uh, you know the requirements that a lot of organisations are, are facing uh, nowadays. So what were the proliferation of uh, cloud app adoption uh, and sort of large mobile uh, workforces is becoming sort of increasingly complicated now to secure that traffic from the typical um, sort of on-premise network security stack. Um, and one of the things that we're noticing as well is what with the remote uh, and sort of roaming users, um, you know, kind of backhauling into that traditional kind of security stack and uh, connectivity model is, is becoming sort of more expensive uh, and it's uh, you know, kind of quite slow as well. So uh, one of the other kind of use cases around those roaming users is uh, that they actually want that speed of access, uh, you know, and kind of being taken directly um, to net as well so they don't want to have to come in and go through those corporate hedge quarters uh, to get their uh, access to their internet applications so the solution that we have for that is a web security service which is obviously the key point that we're here to talk about this morning so it's uh, you know kind of the, the route to get that secure and direct access into the web and into cloud applications so before we go into kind of the core service and what we can provide with our web security service, let's just take a quick look at some of the challenges that we face. So um, uh, for, for some of the guys out there that are uh, probably more interested in the network operation side of things, some of the things that we're seeing is kind of really questions around sort of performance um, and how are they going to connect those users out to the cloud and how is that going to be um, uh, sort of uh, secure uh, from a connection point of view. And then how do we connect those users when they're actually located from uh, other uh, connection points? So if it's a public Wi-Fi, coffee shop, home networks, rather than just the corporate network and then they want to be able to kind of uh, ensure that there is uh, that on-premise security um, that they can afford from uh, the traditional security stack on-premise uh, as to when they're out sort of roaming in any other kind of environment as well some of the other things that we see is obviously as we mentioned previously kind of you know introducing some of these security um, technologies on existing security stacks at the next gen firewalls uh, as an example for things like SSL interception can be quite costly from a, a resource point of view uh, from the on the actual devices and can be quite uh, sort of complicated to implement at the same time on the other side of things, we have um, sort of people that are interested in the security side of things from a compliance point of view. So how do they make sure that all of those kind of you know, emerging threats that are hidden with the encrypted traffic um, are now, uh, you know, we're, we're able to protect those web browsers and those users for? How can we protect that data? How can we protect that user identity? And then again, how can we ensure compliance of those uh, you know, cloud applications that are being used more and more nowadays? So Office 365, Dropbox, and so on and so forth. So if we just kind of now review the capabilities um, of, of WSS and we'll go through sort of uh, um, the, the competencies that we have here. So uh, essentially the web security service is a secure web, gate, a secure web gateway uh, proxy uh, at the heart of it, which is essentially uh, for those of you that will uh, obviously know from the blue coat uh, acquisition, uh, it's the proxy SG at the core. So um, these devices are kind of, you know, tried and tested and sort of, you know, up in the magic garden, uh, garden of magic quadrant uh, for, for 
over a decade now. So with that secure web gateway, what we can actually do is we can authenticate the users for that traffic. We can terminate that traffic. So we are a full proxy in the cloud. So we actually terminate that traffic. But what that enables us to do is decrypt uh, the traffic and SSL inspect that traffic before its delivery uh, and orchestration onto uh, other capabilities within the web security service. So if we have a look at some of those web security, uh, some of those services we have within WSS, so what we can actually do is provide threat prevention uh, uh, around uh, the information security side of things. So we have technology such as web isolation. So this eliminates the risk from users actually being infected from malware just by drive-by attacks uh, and sort of where the attack surface is the, uh, the actual web browser itself. So we can do this with threat risk levels as well. So we can actually um, just uh, minimize the isolation down to particular websites or categories. And we'll come into a little bit more uh, context around that shortly uh, within the presentation. Uh, and again, uh, any, any good web security service wouldn't be, um, uh, you know, it would be lost without malware analysis and sandboxing. So we can actually do the content inspection uh, with uh, uh, you know, the traditional sig uh, signature based um, technologies, but we can also do that via sandboxing as well. And then we can actually, as we say, orchestrate that, those file downloads uh, offer inspection for, uh, you know, against uh, malware and any other kind of types of attacks. And again, when we come to uh, policy control, we can actually incorporate threat risk levels and GOIP based policies. So we can get really granular within that policy. And again, something we'll touch on later. So we can start to actually provide uh, kind of you know, business uh, businesses and uh, end users with the uh, capability and availability to get to those uh, uh, traditional sites that were blocked because it was the unknown category. And what do you do about overblocking that middle ground? Uh, DLP inspection enforcement. So again, we can start to have a, a look at that uh, information protection and apply policies around that and incorporate DLP controls within to the traffic that's passing through WSS. And then CloudSoc, uh, which is our CASB uh, products, we can actually start to have a look at um, a connection into those well-known SaaS applications. So again, uh, Office 365, Salesforce, Box and Dropbox, so on and so forth. So um, one of the things that we first need to think about is how we're actually going to get those users uh, and the traffic into WSS. So we have multiple ways of actually connecting. So we'll call those on ramps for, uh, for one of a better word. So we have flexible ways that we can actually connect uh, within to the service. So we have things like IPsec VPNs, uh, software defined networking with RSD cloud connector. We also have capabilities with integration uh, that's been recently introduced within um, SEP our semantic endpoint protection and also our semantic endpoint protection for mobile devices as well. So it's kind of a real uh, uh, you know, good integration here that kind of follows our strategy of that um, integrated cyber defense platform. So existing customers can also see um, you know, a, a large uh, uh, kind of benefit from other semantic products as well. And again, lastly, but uh, I kind of guess not least, um, you know, all of this um, is uh, uh, kind of uh, delivered via a high performance global backbone. And again, a lot of these uh, capabilities we'll go into uh, a bit more detail shortly. So obviously you want to ensure that anything uh, that, uh, you know, you're subscribing to as an organization has enterprise class protection on the other end to give you that high performance that organizations expect and demand nowadays. And again, performance we've just spoken about here. So we have optimization for Office 365, Salesforce, and this all comes from our, 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 our um, peering within to those um, internet exchanges as well. So again, we can provide some additional performance and capabilities around that traffic shaping as an example. So if we just have a look at some of the, uh, the real quick benefits at a very high level. So these are some of the things that customers can expect to enjoy from the fact of actually subscribing to the web security services. So we, you know, we're kind of talking about it at the, at the outset, kind of reducing that complexity and cost. We can go direct to net. Uh, it's one service with uh, integration within SEP, semantic endpoint protection and semantic endpoint protection mobile. We can actually see kind of the reduction in agents as well. Along with newer technologies such as ST Cloud Connector, we can simplify that branch on ramp using SD WAN capability and technologies. Improved security, obviously, um, you know, we, what we need to do is ensure that the traffic that's actually passing through a cloud service still actually uh, takes advantage of all those security features that you'd have with any on-premise uh, capability. So we can actually start to leverage, as we said previously, content filtering, SSL inspection, uh, uh, malware analysis and content analysis, so on and so forth. And then improve performance, as we said, with regards to uh, uh, peering uh, as well. 
So let's just have a, a quick delve into the WSS uh, capabilities. So let's have a look at a, a summary. So first, we'll take a look at the uh, the proxy uh, at, the cure, at, the, at the core. So remember, this is um, pretty much we're talking around kind of the blue coat technology, if you're familiar with that. So as with any vendor and with any cloud products, what you'd expect is full URL filtering and categorization. So uh, we have uh, integration with the largest civilian threat intelligence network, uh, which is the Global Intelligence Network, which we'll probably refer to as we go through here as the GIN. Um, but as part of that intelligence and telemetry data, um, this is where we get our categories uh, and our, our information database from. So we have 84 categories and broken down into that is 12 security categories. Again, mentioned earlier, and I'll come on to it in a second, is the URL threat risk levels where we can apply additional granular control. So not only can you actually give some accessibility back to the uh, business and the organization, but you can also increase that security control and, uh, and stop opening up that kind of middle ground unnecessarily. And also on the other side of it, stop over blocking that as well. And again, it's also important from a filtering and a categorization point of view to have multiple language um, support, and we have 60 plus within there. Second part of that as we move on is the user authentication and login. So we do uh, integrate with multiple uh, authentication methods. So SAML, uh, we can provide capabilities with that. We can integrate with ADFS, uh, our own uh, VIP uh, product, uh, Okta, so on and so forth. And also we can integrate with on-prem Active Directory. So we integrate with multiple authentication systems providing that uh, 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 control around uh, user, user access uh, and group access. And then we also have that control within semantic endpoint protection and semantic endpoint protection for mobile integrations. As part of the products, uh, you also get a, a very granular logging capability as well. So for all of the compliance, HR methods and security uh, reporting, we provide that within the service as part of the core product. Again, uh, we briefly touched on it earlier, so we can actually uh, uh, emulate that traffic. So we are a full proxy in the cloud, so we fully terminate that traffic. Um, unlike next-gen firewalls that um, can or will just tend to pass that traffic through packet by packet, we'll actually intercept that traffic, fully terminate it, inspect all that content, reassemble that information, so we truly know what's actually going through the network before we actually pass it down to the end user or pass it through policy. Again, uh, decryption is one of the things because we fully terminate that traffic, we can actually selectively decrypt, decrypt traffic. So some of the things that we can do is obviously from a compliance point of view, you may not want to actually intercept uh, financial and healthcare. Again, with the granular policies, we can actually uh, you know, really sort of achieve that granularity within policy to selectively decrypt that traffic. And then again, because we're decrypting that traffic, most of the uh, sort of a, a, or most of the traffic now is SSL, it's encrypted. So if you can't actually see uh, the data that's going through, how are you going to protect the organisation against that? So with the SSL decryption, we can orchestrate that off off to uh, inspection engines. So we'll talk about that in a second. But we're really talking about here the content analysis and malware analysis and DLP and CloudSoft capabilities, further protection outside of that content filtering and categorisation. So one of the things that we need to be concerned with, if we have a look at how sort of uh, uh, yeah, internet tra traffic is uh, is going at the moment, most of that is becoming uh, over TLS, SSL, so most of it is encrypted. So some of traditional cloud security would actually bypass uh, that SSL inspection uh, and therefore avoiding any kind of protection that you can have with that. So what organizations actually need to do is they need to address that and they need to securely decrypt that traffic, that SSL and TLSL, uh, TLS traffic to allow inspection and orchestration, as we said, off to malware analysis, and then actually stop uh, the, the, those, those malware and the, uh, the, 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 the compromised files from coming in to the network. And again, we need to be able to maintain that security policy around that. One of the things that you need to be able to do as well is uh, any uh, um, cloud-based product or any product that's doing SSL interception must be able to do that securely as well. So some uh, some vendors and some products may actually not support as many ciphers. We have the largest cipher support um, currently, I believe, uh, which means that we won't be downgrading that traffic when we actually send it back to, uh, to the end user if we don't support all of the ciphers. Um, there was actually a third party review done where um, Symantec was the only vendor that got an A star rating for their um, support of the most SSL ciphers. 
So now if we have a look at the threat prevention and the information security side of things. So I mentioned it earlier, we have something called the Global Intelligence Network, which as I said is the largest uh, civilian threat intelligence network. So that has uh, unique intelligence fed by multiple vectors. So we can start to have a look at some of these across here now. So we take information from our customers that use in our endpoints. So that's from uh, the enterprise and the consumer. So Symantec and from Norton base. And we're looking uh, around uh, 175 million endpoints. I won't read all the information off of these slides, and you can see there's large numbers here that we're talking about from, uh, from a data point of view. Again, what with the acquisition with, with Bluecoat and from previous um, uh, Symantec products as well, we have a large number, over 80 million of the web proxy users. So we can actually start to ingest all that information and traffic patterns from, from those technologies as well. And also our email, uh, email users. And this data is correlated and analyzed using AI capabilities. And then we find patterns and identify the malware. Um, and then we can start to actually feed that out to our existing customers. And that's all part of the capability of the global intelligence network that's actually fed into the products that you subscribe to from Symantec. So one of the things we mentioned earlier, so along with um, uh, content filtering, so uh, we have the, the, those 84 possible categories, but we can also do risk ratings as well. And this has become a, a really key thing into fine tuning that acceptable use policy. So we'll come on to some examples in a moment here, but you can see sort of we have risk level ratings from one to 10, where one being sort of that's you know kind of uh, yeah, some of the biggest names, you know, you'd be taking sort of, you know, your, your Google and your Amazon, so on and so forth. And these have got, re you know, a really big amount of history around there. Up to 10 where we know there's a lot of malicious uh, activity from those and again so what we can do here is we can actually start to uh, um, stop the overblocking of the middle ground so instead of okay we're going to allow uh, all the known good and deny all the known bad we've got that kind of uh, uh, you know the, the middle part where it's uh, you know beneficial to say okay if this category is uncategorized as an example do we actually really want to block that? Is there any real evidence to say that that is actually a malicious uh, you know, web server on the back end? Sometimes it's not, it's just the fact that it's new and it hasn't been uh, you know, categorized at the moment. But with all of our telemetry information that we get from the gym, we can start to apply risk levels around that. So you can see from here, if it was an uncategorized uh, website, as an example, but we was actually rating uh, the service behind it, anything up to say a one, two, three, or potentially a four, we can actually start to allow that as well giving sort of, you know, the business use back uh, and sort of, you know, uh, stop that overblocking of that middle ground, as I said. There's a real interesting use case around here for web isolation, and that's something that I'll touch on in a minute, and we'll probably maybe just come back to a very similar side, just giving uh, another kind of view of that as well. So if we have a look <clears throat> uh, again at the, um, uh, the kind of content inspection side of things. So as we said, we can leverage that URL and the threat risk ratings, the SSL interception, uh, you know, the category and the policy uh, on the traditional proxy type capabilities. Um, and then we're terminating that, uh, that traffic and extracting those files. So when we're actually extracting those files, we can now start to pass them off to our content filtering capabilities. So first off, we look through whitelisting and blacklisting, which is maintained again, as I said, from the Global Intelligence Network, and also Semantics Advanced Machine Learning. And then we start to pass that through uh, not one, but two AV engines for your traditional content uh, and your signature-based uh, protection. And we, what we will do there is we're actually pre-filtering to improve that detection and reduce load onto the sandbox because we also then have the sandbox in the malware analysis capabilities where we can actually start to uh, emulate and we can start to fully uh, detonate uh, those particular files should they pass all of the other inspection capabilities. And then again, we can start to provide reports based on the indicators of compromise and what that actual file would have done. The last part to that is if we do detect anything in the sandbox that was potentially a zero day, all of that information is fed back and updated into the global intelligence network so that we can inform other devices that uh, you as an organization may uh, already subscribe to or you may already have installed within your environment. And also it passes out to other semantic endpoint protection customers and uh, uh, other customers that have semantic products. So uh, it, you know everyone can take advantage to all of that telemetry information that we see and that we report back into our products. One of the other um, kind of areas that we're seeing now <clears throat> is a kind of an emerging threat where the web browser is actually becoming the attack surface. So we've just covered sort of uh, uh, the, the, the train of thought where, you know, um, 
you know, an area where malware is being delivered through malicious content downloads. But then again, what have we, you know, the, what about the scenario where a user just gets infected by simply going to a malicious URL? So cyber criminals are always using social engineering techniques, phishing, etc., to try and get people to go to these sorts of sites uh, more and more. And, uh, and phishing, as you probably know, is probably one of the biggest uh, sources of uh, malware infection um, and, 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 and attack capabilities. So every time a user is actually browsing the web, uh, the browser downloads many of these different types of plugins and, and files as well. So what we can actually start to look to do is actually protect that attack surface before anything is actually truly downloaded. So this is where we have our isolation capabilities. So what we can do is we can isolate the uncategorized and risky sites. And as I said, so if we think back to the previous example, we can say if something's uncategorized and it's a risk level of say four through to seven being the example, instead of actually blocking that now where previously we might have allowed the lower risk levels, we can actually start to isolate those uh, particular sites. So again, we're not actually over blocking and denying the business from actually getting uh, access to some sites that they still may need to. So essentially what it is, is it's a secure browsing. Um, so we send that off to our web isolation technology where it's downloaded, executed, and rendered in a secure disposable container. Then that information is actually sent back down for rendering to the endpoint, which is 100% safe and, and, and avoids the whole zero day, uh, zero patient type infection. None of that actual content is ever being rendered actually on the endpoint. It's all rendered actually in and executed in that secure disposable container. It's agentless, so there's no additional um, uh, products that are required on the endpoint. And also it doesn't stop any of the, uh, the normal capabilities that you'd have within a website. So right clicking, scrolling, so on and so forth. None of that is actually affected. To, to all intents and purposes, the end user, um, other than a few telltale signs, ordinarily don't even know that that website is actually being isolated. Following on for that, one of the things that we can do is for the file content and download, if they do still require to download something from that, we can actually still take a look at that capability and then still pass that uh, uh, particular file through the content analysis, and again, going back through the whitelist through to the content filtering from the AV and then the sandboxing capabilities. So you still have all that secure protection should you actually wish to download something from that particular site that's been isolated. We have a couple of types of um, uh, policy enforcement. I'll just quickly touch on those, um, but just so as uh, you can kind of get an understanding, what we typically say is, okay, we can have selective isolation, which is just for the uncategorized and the th higher threat list levels. But also what we can do is start to isolate particular users. So it might be the C-level um, execs that you might want to fully isolate. One of the benefits of web isolation is in fact, we can actually um, uh, block effectively the password exfiltration. So if someone goes to a fake Office 365 site or a site that's actually looks like it's uh, uh, non-HTTPS, but is asking for inputs from uh, uh, user credentials and password, we can block those with this technology as well. So if we go back to one of the original uh, slides that I was talking about here where we're using threat risk levels to kind of stop over blocking that middle ground, we can actually now say, okay, well, we can uh, we can isolate that. So it almost completely eliminates that time wasted in responding to, to web requests, sending those tickets off to operation teams for people to open up access. And then again, if that access particularly becomes um, uh, sort of, uh, or that server becomes malicious in the future, you've already allowed access to that. With this kind of scenario, you still increase that security security posture um, as well. Information protection is one of the side of things that we're seeing more and more uh, requirement as a capability within the web security product. So we integrate with our semantic enterprise DLP. So uh, we can enforce those policies uh, up in the cloud so we can be compliant with those uh, uh, cloud applications and the traffic that's going through. One of the key benefits that we do here is actually using our cloud detection service. We actually scan that content up in the cloud rather than actually backhauling it back into the on-premise uh, uh, to, to do the scanning there. So avoiding any kind of latency that's uh, brought, you know, brought into and introduced from that type of method. And then again, we have the existing uh, investment of the on-premise DLP. So all of those policies, training, workflows, and that orchestration can still be done from that on-premise DLP, but we can actually push policy and apply that information protection to uh, the, the web security service and the traffic that's going through, uh, through, through that. And that will protect that traffic from wherever the user is. So if they're a roaming user and they're still protected by web security service, we can actually take advantage of that DLP outside of the network and when they're off network. 
Quickly touching on to uh, our cloud control. So uh, CloudSock is our CASB product. Um, we ha have uh, yeah, excellent integration within uh, our, uh, our CASB. So uh, from our proxy point of view, we have our CASB audit. So we have risk attribute data on over 30,000 cloud applications. Um, and we can feed all of the traffic and the logs from our proxy service. So from your offices, from your roaming users, and we can feed that into our CloudSock product. What this will do is we'll then actually see what cloud applications you're using. So you'll truly get an understanding of what cloud-based services, SaaS applications that users are consuming nowadays. So with this, you may have a program to consolidate onto different types of file sharing services, email services, so on and so forth. And you may even want to restrict access to risky applications. With the CASB audit and the CloudSock product as first pass round uh, kind of an implementation of a CASB product, you can actually, once you've pushed those logs up in there for, for audit, we can bring down an application feed. So we can then start to say, okay, if we're standardizing on a particular file sharing application and allowing one other, we can actually start to block via application as well. So all of that uh, administrative control, uh, all of the policy control is now taken back from uh, you know, uh, the, the operationals team and finding out the URLs and uh, you know, the IP addresses, so on and so forth. And we can just use that intelligence data to block an application by name. Again, we can have uh, DLP uh, enforcement with either the, on uh, the, uh, the DLP that's um, inherent within uh, WSS when extending that into our semantic uh, enterprise DLP, or there is actually native DLP within our cloud SOC cloud, uh, product as well. We touched on briefly uh, earlier, flexible on ramps. So we have a number of routes to get um, into our WSS service. So as part of the product, we have IPsec, uh, VPN uh, capabilities within to uh, WSS. Uh, proxy chaining, so we can uh, uh, chain from existing proxies. So if you have a, a Bluecoat product, uh, an old Bluecoat Blue proxy server or Squid, TMG, anything like that, some of the old capabilities, probably more of a, uh, a migration strategy, we can actually chain from there. Mentioned earlier briefly, SD Cloud Connector based on SD-WAN technologies and capabilities, we can actually use that for branch locations and a quick on-ramp into WSS. We also work with third-party SD-WAN, so they're part of the technology uh, 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 program, where we can integrate with those third parties, nicely creating uh, IPsec tunnels from uh, multiple of SD-WAN vendors and providers. Lastly, and not least, uh, laptops and mobile devices. So we can provide an agent. So we have semantic endpoint protection and semantic endpoint protection for mobile uh, to protect Windows devices, Windows 10, uh, and also iOS and Android. And we also have what is known as uh, probably a legacy agent, our WSS unified agent. So for customers out there that aren't uh, an existing subscriber to semantic endpoint protection, we still have the capability from an agent there as well. And we can also deploy pack files uh, uh, with, with that solution. One of the capabilities that we've just uh, released is a, um, a, a connector for Windows 10 S uh, machines. So uh, Windows um, uh, will, will be kind of uh, releasing a, a version of the operating system where you will actually kind of have to, and you're being forced from a managed service point of view, to download applications from the Microsoft Store, similar that you do in, say, uh, the, uh, the Apple Store or Google Play. So we now have a, a connector uh, within that capability as well, which has just been released. So again, we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we said uh, sort of, you know, with, with the semantic endpoint uh, integrations, uh, we have some great uh, on-ramp and uh, 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 capabilities there. So up in the top left, um, you know, you may want to use an existing proxy as an example or VPN technology to go into the web security service. But from the branch locations, SD Cloud Connector can be a, a really great solution uh, for that uh, implementation. And then for roaming and mobile users, we have that capability, that integration with SEP as well. Again, just reducing on the uh, you know, amount of uh, agents that uh, will be on the endpoint. And again, uh, high performance and global, uh, global backbone um, is one of the things that you would expect from an enterprise class uh, uh, service. So we have multiple uh, data centers around uh, the globe. So any of the data centers that we have stand up, you can use those. Um, we don't uh, restrict any customers. There's no additional fee or cost to be able to actually use those. And that becomes more and more important when you have a global operation, obviously. And again, uh, I won't read the, uh, the bullet points through here, but we have the standard five nines for 
for SLA um, and we have redundancy within those points um, as well. So again, I think we've got sort of, you know, in excess of 50 data centers now uh, across, uh, across the globe. And here are just some of the ones that are um, coming up on the screen now. Again, um, we're, we're talking about performance here. So we're looking at um, being optimized um, in this particular instance, specifically for Office 365. So we can simplify that governance. So we actually partner with um, uh, Microsoft and we work very closely with them to ensure in our services work uh, smoothly uh, with um, things like Office 365. So we actually um, automate that classification of the application traffic. So we can start to apply granular policy around those different types of applications within Office 365. And again, we can also um, work with uh, Microsoft to actually ingest those forever changing IP addresses and URLs as well. So we can efficiently um, enforce security policy. One of the other benefits that we have is because it's Blue Code Proxy SG technology within the cloud, we've had this optimization within the product for a number of years now. So we can actually apply TCP window scaling um, and et cetera to provide uh, a more accelerated user experience. So I think one of the key points around that is it's not necessarily um, speeding up the user experience from what they would have, but what we're saying really is by putting an additional proxy server in front shouldn't actually cause you any problems because of that accelerated user experience that we can provide through that. Again, on top of that, we have uh, optimized content peering um, in a number of the, uh, the main uh, internet exchanges where we'll peer with Office 365, Salesforce, Google, Azure, so on and so forth. Um, and one of the um, uh, things just to call out here um, for the fact that we do work closely with Office 365, um, we recently had a press release out that was supported by Microsoft and included a statement within there saying how they uh, recognize um, semantic web security services can protect organizations and their Office 365 traffic. So just coming to a roundup then, um, very quickly, we had a look at these requirements earlier at the beginning of the, um, uh, the, the session and we were saying, you know, how can we protect organizations from those encrypted uh, uh, threats uh, and from malware? Um, how can we ensure the compliance of that data in Office 365 uh, and Dropbox so on and so forth? And how can you simplify that performance uh, and that ongoing operational uh, kind of uh, um, complication of uh, providing security around that traditional stack and then the performance actually of going through a cloud-based solution and i think we've got some of the uh, kind of the answers here with the wss solution here on the right so just conscious uh, of time just got a couple of slides to go through and then i think uh, we can just quickly stop for a, for a q and a so one of the things i did want to uh, just kind of mention whilst we've got all these great capabilities within wss we have a complement uh, a comprehensive enterprise class security stack um, one of the things that you may have seen coming up very shortly, I believe it's due to go GA um, in March, is we've actually partnered with Fortinet. So what we actually will be providing is a cloud-based firewall service for WSS as well. So um, you can get obviously more details through uh, through um, through Bytes or through ourselves. Um, and what we just kind of really want to uh, outline here is that if you're uh, interested in providing protection around any other kind of traffic other than the standard HTTP, HTTPS over port 80 and 443, we will have that cloud firewall service as with our partnership with Fortinet. One of the things, just lastly, I wanted to touch on, there may be some organizations here that um, are using our semantic uh, websecurity.cloud product. Um, you may be aware that that has end of life. So I'll just quickly uh, go through here. So the end of life, um, the, re, uh, the, um, uh, the announcement was September the 3rd, 2018. Um, end of support is actually September the 3rd, 2019, and extended support is 3rd, 2019 of December. What we are offering though is customers, as uh, it says there, that have uh, already got websecurity.cloud and are moving to WSS, they will automatically receive 90 days of free websecurity.cloud uh, service to allow for that migration. While we're talking about the migration, we provide um, a very simple and easy way to migrate from uh, security.cloud into WSS. So essentially, this can be done from the outset when you're first um, provisioning the tenant from WSS, um, or it can be done um, sort of post uh, POC, as an example, meaning that you can actually transfer those existing rules and policy where applicable from semantic.cloud easily within to WSS. 
may not be particularly clear on the screenshot here, but um, kind of the, the slide at the back shows uh, an indication of when you first log on to the, uh, the web service when you're provisioning the tenant, you can actually provide the credentials to your security.cloud and it will go into the security.cloud service and it will pull out those security rules. What it will then do is it will analyze those rules and tell you which ones that you can import, which ones don't uh, natively work within um, WSS. Um, and you'll be able to have the chance to actually go in, either remove those rules or import within, with, uh, with a warning within there and then remove them after. But essentially simplifying logging uh, that uh, or uh, bringing that, um, uh, those, those rules and that policy into WSS. So appreciate it was probably uh, a very high level and a quick fly uh, through. Um, sort of 30 minutes is, is probably enough to do a high level, but not enough to go into anything in depth. So uh, Amy, I'll um, hand back to you and uh, opening up for any questions. Brilliant, thanks Mark. Um, so yep, if you do have any questions, there is a questions box just at the right hand side of your screen. Um, if you just write those in there, I'll read them out. So we'll just wait to see if any come through. Oh, um, there's one here already. It says, how is the licensing packaged? So, good question. Licensing is done on, in the main, is done on a per user uh, base. So, we will, um, you know, you will subscribe to the amount of users that you have in an organization. So, that's for the core service. Now, if you required, um, as an example, um, protection uh, for, for mobile devices, um, and or you needed the agent, you would only actually subscribe to the number that you needed the agent for. But as a whole, it's actually a uh, user-based subscription. Question from the same person. They said, is there a minimum number or users, or of users maybe? Uh, nope. So the more users um, that we subscribe to the service, um, it just change, changes the, uh, the price break uh, for customers. So the more users uh, that you add, uh, the better it is from a cost point of view. But there is no limit. Theoretically, there's no limit to uh, the number of users you can put through the service. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> um, so I don't think we've got any more questions from, from the look of things. Um, there is our email address on the screen there if you would like to submit any outside of the webinar today. Um, and as mentioned at the beginning, there is a critique form at the end. So if you'd like any further information or if you have any feedback for us, please pop that in there. Um, and then I will also, I'll send you a link to the recording, um, most probably tomorrow morning. I'll try and get it done this afternoon, but if not, it'll be tomorrow morning. Um, so yeah, so thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. And thank you so much, Mark, for presenting. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day today. Thank you.